You see, the, you are called. The proof call is that you are informed that this is your status. They've come to visit you based on your, some, uh, you may not be able to um, self-isolate. You are given a place and they come very quietly to you. Those you see in their Rambo style approach, those who are evading the isolation, those who are either switching off their phones or they are running away and they are not allowing them to join. Some of them are picking the evening quietly, but it is when people are evading that we need to look at other means of trying to, in collaboration with the community, see how they can be picked. But um, if everybody cooperated as we do, I don't think we will have such a, a challenge. One of the new th systems that we have to develop here is everybody talks about test, trace, isolate. We have to have testing in every region and then an army of tracers. You're talking about thousands of tracers who take every positive, call up every positive. Who did you go to dinner with? Who did you, uh, whatever and then isolate those people, and you have to have facilities to isolate people who can't be isolated. Uh, some people can't be isolated at home. We are beginning a program today, and it's a pilot program, which will certainly grow into something larger and larger, and that is a community contact tracing program. The purpose of this program is to bring on people, as we do more testing, we will find more and more people who have COVID-19 and again, we'll isolate every one of them and we will find every one of their contacts and we will make sure that they stay quarantined. It's not just our county that's bringing more people on. There are gonna be thousands of, of people hired who will be these contact investigators throughout the state. And this is occurring in many, many other states as well, perhaps all of the states. We also realize that as we find more contacts, some of the people we find are going to have trouble being isolated. For instance, if they live in a home where there's only one bathroom and there are three or four other people living there and those people don't have COVID infection, we're not gonna be able to keep the person in that home. Every person who we're isolating, for instance, needs to have uh, their own bathroom. And so we'll be moving people like this into other kinds of housing. And more importantly, a very rapid system of getting those people uh, out, of, out of their homes. Now we need to go and look in families to find those people who may be sick and remove them and isolate them. Uh, we, we need a national plan for contact tracing. And uh, it's, it's, you know, right now each individual province is doing it, but we need a national plan, work with the federal government and uh, all, all, uh, all the provinces, the, the 10 provinces and the three territories. It's absolutely critical uh, moving forward uh, for many reasons, especially not to mention uh, research as well. So what is contact tracing and how does it work? Well, if a case of COVID-19 is confirmed, Individuals who have had close contact with the person will be traced and given advice on what to do if they are unwell or develop symptoms. A new NHS smartphone app is expected to play a key role in identifying those who have been exposed. People with the app can voluntarily opt in to record details of their symptoms when they start to feel unwell. Using short-range Bluetooth signals, the app will work out who that person has been close to and will anonymously alert other app users to tell them and recommend they self-isolate or get tested if needed. People on the Isle of Wight will be the first in the UK to trial the app next week. I want this, um, this pilot scheme because it protects the island better and it protects my at-risk groups because the track taste and, ch and, and test scheme is going to enable us to find where the virus is on the island and by looking after those people with it, we can get to kill it faster. And the information that we're gonna give is gonna provide a roadmap to how the app functions in a two or three weeks time when it is rolled out nationally. The government says it needs 50 to 60% of people to download the contact tracing app for it to be a success. If all goes well, the technology will be rolled out nationwide later this month.
Imagine what a task it would be to recall all the people one has crossed paths with in the past few days, let alone weeks, for COVID-19 contact tracing purposes. Earlier this month, Singapore launched its Trace Together app. It gives off short-distance Bluetooth signals between smartphones of users in close proximity. If a user is diagnosed with COVID-19, health authorities can gain access to the app data to identify the people the user has had close contact with. Extremely useful information, but it raises concerns about privacy issues and government surveillance. Singapore's not the only country to adopt digital contact tracing methods. China goes even further, assigning citizens a colour-coded level based on their health condition and travel history, which determines whether they're allowed into malls or public transport, for example. South Korea's sharing previous movements of COVID-19 patients, which has led to residents being outed for non-COVID-19 related reasons and public shaming. Israel has an app that warns users if they've crossed paths with an infected patient, and Taiwan has introduced a digital fence using smartphone data to enforce quarantines. All novel ideas which perhaps in ordinary times would come under heavier scrutiny where rights issues are concerned. Massachusetts has the third most cases of the coronavirus in the U.S. and the death toll there has nearly doubled in the past week. Tonight, the hotspot is the first state to launch a large-scale program to track down people who've been exposed to COVID-19. It's called contact tracing. And as Meg Oliver shows us, the state is deploying an army of disease detectives. I'm grabbing her from the elevator. Dr. Dean Xeris took us inside this COVID hotel for the most vulnerable. Hola, Wendy. Wendy Rosales found out over the phone last week she was exposed to COVID-19. After testing positive, she's now quarantined for 14 days. What was it like when you got the phone call? Uh, um, the first thing that I thought is I was going to die. I was very afraid. The 35-year-old wife and mother of two is from Chelsea, north of Boston, a densely populated immigrant area with the highest infection rate in the state. So you were exposed on Wednesday, April uh, 15th. Krista so Cass is a contact tracer working from her Boston apartment. Start thinking about what you were doing two days before. She calls at least 20 people a day who recently tested positive for COVID-19 and then anyone they may have exposed. There are some people that had no idea that, you know, two days ago they came into contact with somebody who is now positive. Um, so it's also a question of, well, what do I do? And it, it's a lot of education on our point. Massachusetts has invested $44 million in disease detectives who will reach at least 120,000 close contacts, all of it critical to bending the curve. This kind of approach also could create millions of jobs, mm -hmm. right? Put people to work fighting the epidemic, make a public health core. Um, across the nation. Alexa, me no mommy. A core now calling people like Wendy Rosales. How hard is it to be away from your family? It's brutal. It's very hard. Lloramos todos. We, we cry every day. You cry every day? This is such a vast spider web of contacts. This data uh, that we'll be transferring between phones will now be encrypted. What more do we know about how this is actually going to work? The clamor to improved contact tracing has seen nations like Israel, Singapore, South Korea, and of course China using a combination of location data, video camera footage, and credit card information to track and contain COVID-19 in their countries. We're prepared and we're doing a great job with it. And it will go away, just stay calm, it will go away. We the U.S. Protect. has lagged behind, but Google and Apple are feverishly building a contact tracing platform scheduled for release in mid-May. It will enable the use of Bluetooth technology to help governments and health agencies reduce the spread of the virus by tracing people who have come into close contact with COVID-19. But how exactly this information will be used in the future and with whom is an open question. Oh, we're kind of at this fascinating moment, right, where uh, we don't know exactly what the response is going to look like. Uh, we know that robust contact tracing is going to be a huge part of reopening the economy. Um, and we know that we have to balance that with uh, privacy concerns somehow, uh, but we don't know exactly what the balance is going to look like. Uh, and I leave it up to the epidemiologist to say whether you need to be 
uh, as repressive as China, or if there are ways to protect privacy, we might not have a ton of time to uh, debate it. And that's kind of the problem. There are currently few legal protections from data misuse or abuse. And while some states do have some laws in place, progress on this front has been halted. There was some privacy momentum in Congress before the pandemic hit, and that's been destroyed for obvious reasons. California passed a privacy law a couple of years ago, and there's been a lot of work to try to improve it as it goes into effect this year. A bunch of other states had been considering privacy legislation as well, like Washington State and New York. And then COVID comes, and a lot of the state legislatures have just pretty much shut down. Now, before you envision a Black Mirror episode for your personal future, you should know that as of now, involvement will be voluntary. The data it collects is to be anonymized, and there will be no central server where the data is stored, so governments or corporations can't directly grab all this private data for its own purposes. But that could easily change. But there's nothing really to stop them from having a centralized database. Um, it's only kind of the restraint of our expectations. If our expectations uh, were to become overturned and again shift tremendously over to safety, it could become a lot more Orwellian a lot quicker. There's many scenarios that could be quite troubling. Your information could be given to insurance companies and it could be used as a pre-existing condition that prevents you from getting insurance or as a reason to charge you much higher prices. The information could be sold to data brokers who could then package it to anyone that they want. The information could end up with your employer who could use it to make decisions about whether to promote you because of your health. Now, that may sound a little paranoid, but we have good reason to be suspicious. These are entities that already collect enormous amounts of our data in a, in a commercial context, and whose mishandling of data has come under fire in the past. Exhibit A. Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica. We just traded away like everything there is to know about ourselves, you know, for Farmville. And I think that people are starting to realize that wasn't a good trade. In 2016, the big data company Cambridge Analytica took the personal data of millions of Americans from Facebook. They packaged it and sold it so that political groups could then target parts of the population with narrow casted messages. You know, people were sharing information with friends and they weren't necessarily expecting that data to be shared by a, a company like Cambridge Analytica that was making use of it to build political profiles and then serve uh, specific advertisements or propaganda. Cambridge Analytica really captures the dilemma of privacy, which is how data collected for one reason and with certain expectations is used for another reason. We have been giving away all of our most private information to companies that have then sold it on and created what is now a multi-trillion dollar a year industry. This was business as usual as far as Facebook developers went. This scandal resulted in the Federal Trade Commission's fining of Facebook for $5 billion, as well as a general push for broader privacy laws. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. What you're seeing is a greater bipartisan concern about the power of these dataopolis and how do we rein them in. So how do we know this isn't going to happen this time? The answer comes back to those privacy protection laws that have been put on hold because of the pandemic. If there had been a national privacy law enacted before the pandemic hit us, we probably would have been in a better position to respond to it with data. But even if there was a national privacy law in place, contact tracing is actually pointless if we don't have widespread testing to go along with it which we don't. So what is this about? Is this a smokescreen for collecting a lot of data? Is the data truly gonna stay anonymized or aggregated? The pandemic is showing why a general privacy law is so important because there's so much confusion around data collection 
concern that there will be overreach and lack of rules about how the information could be reused for other purposes. Laws are going to be needed to stem a lot of this corporate data collection. And I think you're only going to see those efforts continue. You know, short term, I think they may be delayed because of COVID, but I think the, the fundamental concerns uh, around overly broad corporate collection aren't going away. I don't see some centralized bureaucracy um, that will then be shared with the police uh, and the IRS and your future employer and your future uh, insurer, uh, at least not right now. Uh, but it is worth noting that um, some of those things aren't forbidden. Uh, we're going to get deep into the testing strategy going forward and the linkage to contact tracing and what that is going to look like in Louisiana. I will tell you that we are looking to bring online 700 workers are working out of three call centers across the state of Louisiana, but, but inside the state of Louisiana, uh, supervised by epidemiologists uh, and trained. Uh, and obviously the information you get from testing is fed to the contact tracing individuals. They then start calling the individual who tests positive and try to figure out for that time period when uh, the individual who was positive became contagious until that conversation who have you been in close contact with? And they have all these things that they have to learn. They then get those names and contact information as best they can. Then they start calling those individuals. Uh, do, do you have symptoms? If so, you really need to go get a test. If you don't have symptoms, understand you may have been exposed to someone uh, and therefore you really need to spend about 14 days uh, by yourself. Well, three key things must be in place to safely reopen the economy. Enough testing to find positive cases, contact tracing to identify anyone they came in contact with, and a place for those people to isolate. Test, trace, isolate is the mantra, and governments everywhere are figuring out how best to do it. Because even when the curve is flattened, the virus is still out there. Smartphone apps are one way to contact trace. Alberta is using one, but as Heather Urex west explains, it's far from perfect. The people in this room are doing some of the most important work in the fight against COVID-19. They are contact tracers and their job is to find people who may have been exposed. So we're breaking chains of transmission through the contact tracing and also identifying, as I said, potential sources that there might be a cluster happening that we need to identify. Without proper contact tracing, a small outbreak can quickly get out of hand. But the work is tedious and imperfect, relying on people to remember everywhere they went and everyone they saw going back two weeks or more. If you ask them what they did three, one day ago, four days ago, five days ago, it takes a while for that recall. It's why provinces are looking at supplementing their contact tracing work with new technology. Alberta was the first to launch its own smartphone app. AB Trace Together uses Bluetooth to build a record of other app-enabled phones that have been nearby within two meters for at least 15 minutes. Those records are kept on the phone for 21 days. If a user tests positive for COVID-19, they can consent to upload those records to assist public health contact tracers who can then call anyone who may have been exposed. But in order for the app to work on iPhones, users must make sure the app is open and the phone is unlocked every time they go out. And while more than 100,000 Albertans have downloaded the app, more than 2 million need to use it in order for it to work. The University of Oxford study details it pretty well. We need 50 to 60 percent adoption rate in order for these apps to be effective. Morgan Chan's team has developed a different kind of app, one that uses GPS. Whether to adopt an app and which one is a decision each province and territory will have to make. But there's a growing call for a national strategy as well. Because if people keep use all different kind of tools, uh, then they'll be more difficult. And some contacts, of course, may go in between provinces. So I think that's a, a important area of discussion. With little time to waste as Canada works towards a new normal under the still present threat of COVID-19. And of course, we're developing the contact tracing app, which can help us deliver test, track and trace on the mass scale that we need across the country. The app, which takes full consideration of privacy and security, has already been tested in closed conditions at an RAF base. And today I can announce the next steps. From tomorrow, we will begin to pilot, test, track and trace on the Isle of Wight. 
One key aspect of fighting the spread of the virus is tracking down those who've had contact with someone who's infected. News Channel reporter Senator De Los Santos spoke with Ventura County health experts about plans to beef up what's known as contact tracing. That's right, contact tracing is not a new effort for Ventura County. The health department has been doing it since the virus broke out, but now public health is expanding its efforts in a major way. So we want to make sure when we're calling them, it's only supportive, it's only to, to help them. Ventura All County Public Health is in the process of training 60 new contact tracers. That's triple the number from just a month ago. I believe one public health nurse with 10 contact tracers and so they're going to work together as a team to make sure that each positive uh, COVID case in Ventura County has the contact tracing um, staff to work with them. Every time there is a positive COVID-19 lab test, it's reported directly to the Ventura County Public Health Department. Public health nurse interview each positive lab case, confirmed case, and during that interview, we will find out who lives in the house. We will find out if they're working. We will ask them if they've been out. The contact tracers will then get in contact with anyone who has been exposed. Then they will ask them to monitor themselves, checking their temperature twice a day. Contact investigators reach out in several ways, including calling and making home visits. And if it's someone that is refusing, we will definitely consult with our health officer uh, to, to look into next steps. The person who originally tested positive stays in isolation for 14 days. Ventura County will provide a free hotel room and meals if patients can't easily isolate. Or if we determine that there might be a high risk family members such as a senior. We have a special housing program that we can offer them. First they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I did not speak out. Because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out. Because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out. Because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. It depends on you.